serves as a very unique piece of literature during the Victorian age, seeing as its author Charlotte Bronte challenges the 19th century ideals of female behavior and highlights what life was truly like for women during this time. Before I jump into discussing various aspects from the novel, I would like to touch on some background information and how that correlates to the story in order to help us understand what was going on and assist us in analyzing how that was portrayed throughout Bronte's fiction. The Victorian period begins in 1837, which was when Queen Victoria became queen, um, and it ended in 1901 upon her death. Um, so seven years prior, in 1830, that was considered the end of the Romantic period in Britain um, and the rise of Victorianism. Now because Queen Victoria died right at the start of a new century, it was kind of convenient to consider that time period um, Victorian. During this time, many of the middle class was increasing in number and status, and many dreamed of joining the ranks of the nobles, and acting properly was what they saw to be the first step in achieving that dream. Also during this time, we know that Britain was a large imperial power, and they had successfully expanded into Africa, India, and the Middle East, uh, which resulted in an increased use of the English language, um, trade and a long-standing animosity in the colonized regions persisted. Uh, literature during that time period um, all has a has a common theme of this drive for social advancement. We see that in novels such as Great Expectations by Charles Dickens, um, Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen, and obviously Jane Eyre, um, and all all the characters in these stories are seen as kind of uh, rebellious and um, in many ways these works of literature heavily influenced the modernist period which would follow. Men and women's roles became more defined during the Victorian era. Um, prior it had been usual for women to work alongside their husbands but as the 19th century progressed men came to dominate work in shops, offices, and factories. Women stuck to the home and their job was to attend to domestic duties. Um, so the less your wife had to do, the more well off you were. It was kind of like a, a sign of status. And um, with that, we see the rise of different styles of dress for women, um, such as the corset, which kind of prevented you from doing any, any type of efficient task. Um, in the 1830s, women adopted the crinoline, which was a huge bell-shaped skirt that made it impossible to pretty much do anything. So um, this idea of having two separate spheres based on gender was very prevalent. Um, so women were seen as weaker but morally superior, so their role was to dominate the household and educate the children. Women themselves were educated to become sort of the angels of the house, and many were sent to boarding schools as young girls and um, worked as governesses, which were people who would privately educate children for nobles in their homes. Um, a quote from Jane Austen really exemplifies this idea of um, w what was ideal for women during this time period. A woman must have a thorough knowledge of music, singing, drawing, dancing, and the modern languages. And besides all this, she must possess a certain something in, in her air and manner of walking the tone of her voice, her address, and expressions. Um, so nobody really wanted to be something that was called a blue stocking, which was um, considered to be a woman who was too focused on her education or, or too intelligent. And the next two clips show um, excerpts from a How to Draw Flowers book that women would have used um, in school growing up. Women were taught to not be overly sexual and to not focus too much on finding a husband that was seen as very unattractive. So many married in their mid-twenties and their husbands are usually five years older. They had to stay chaste until marriage and really couldn't talk to men and that is a huge theme that is seen in Jane Eyre that I will touch upon later. All of this led to kind of emotional frustrations which would eventually lead to rebellion. Charlotte Bronte, the author of Jane Eyre, was born in 1816 and died in 1855. She can be considered a very unique female writer during this time period because she chose to really focus on the things people weren't saying. She chose to highlight the hardships that women were facing during this time, which was not taken very lightly by society. 
Um, and we know this because she published all of her works under the pseudonym Curier Bell. So she was trying to keep her identity concealed because she knew that her works were not going to be generally liked by the public. So before I get into um, some specific scenes from the novel, I want to give you a brief summary of Jane Eyre as a whole so that it'll be easier to kind of piece together um, what I'm talking about. So the novel starts off with Jane Eyre's perspective as a 10 year old living as an orphan with her aunt Reed. There she is bullied by her cousin John as well as her aunt and is consistently humiliated. On one occasion, she is locked in something called the Red Room as a punishment. This scene is significant because it symbolizes the utter frustration and inequality Jane expresses throughout the entire novel, even as an adult. Seen as intolerable and disrespectful, Jane is sent to a boarding school to learn how to become a proper lady. There, she is subject to discrimination by the teachers who segregate her from the rest of the girls due to her rebellious behavior. Jane later becomes a governess and is hired to work for the mysterious Mr. Rochester. Soon after her arrival there, she and Mr. Rochester develop an enigmatic relationship that leads Jane to express her true desires for both equality and a sense of identity. Mr. Rochester proposes to Jane and at the wedding she comes to find out that he's actually married and his mad wife Bertha has been hidden on the third floor of Thornfield Hall for the last few years. Poor and angry Jane leaves Thornfield and finds refuge from three siblings named Mary, Diana, and Sinjin Rivers at their manor called Marsh End. Sinjin is a clergyman and finds Jane a job teaching at a charity school. Sinjin surprises her and tells her that her uncle who died had left her a huge fortune of 20,000 pounds. Jane asks him how he had found out the information and he reveals that her uncle is also his and that they are cousins. Because he is a clergyman, he sets out on missionary work to India and asks Jane to come along with him as his wife. Jane refuses to marry but goes along. She soon realizes that she cannot abandon the man she truly loves, Mr. Rochester, and goes back to Thornfield Hall only to find the house completely burned down by angry Bertha. Rochester had managed to save his servants from the fire, but in the process lost his eyesight and one of his hands. At his new residence in Ferndine, Jane and Rochester rebuild their relationship and remarry. She writes at the end of the novel that they had been married for 10 years and have enjoyed a perfect equality in their life together. So now that you guys have a um, pretty good understanding of the gist of what happened in Jane Eyre, I'm going to um, go a little bit more in depth in three scenes specifically and how it ties back to women's gender roles during the Victorian age. In chapter 12, Jane expresses her strong belief about allowing women to use their talents in more places than just the home. Women are supposed to be very calm generally, but women feel just as men feel. They need exercise for their faculties and a field for their efforts as much as their brothers do. They suffer from too rigid a restraint, too absolute a stagnation, precisely as men would suffer, and it is narrow-minded in their more privileged fellow creatures to say that they ought to confine themselves to making puddings and knitting stockings, to playing on the piano and embroidering bags. And we know that the author, Charlotte Brondi herself, had been a governess like Jane, so um, it is very likely that her own views were paralleled in that of her character, Jane. The theme of sort of this emotional frustration among women is also very prevalent in Jane Eyre in two specific scenes. Um, firstly, the scene where young Jane is locked in the red room for um, seemingly misbehaving Um, and secondly um, the fact that Mr. Rochester's mad wife Bertha had been locked up for um, years at Thornfield Hall so it kind of shows that um, you know in the case of Jane as a young child her cousin John gets her in trouble and in Bertha's case Mr. Rochester um, shows complete dominance and control over her. Um, It is also made clear that Bertha has been condemned because she was overly sexual which was not a good quality for a woman to have during the Victorian age as I discussed earlier. Passionate feelings um, kind of 
are symbolized in Jane Eyre through fire. Um, and we can see this when Bertha decides to burn down the entire Thornfield Hall out of frustration that her husband um, was courting another woman. Um, and it is also shown through Jane's passionate desires for um, her own sort of equality and well-being. I have lived a full life here. I have not been trampled on, I have not been petrified. I have not been excluded from every glimpse of what is bright. I have known you, Mr. Rochester, and it strikes me with anguish to be torn from you. Then why must you leave? Because of your wife. I have no wife. But you are to be married. Jane, you must stay. I become nothing to you. Am I a machine without feelings? Do you think that because I am poor, obscure, plain and little, that I am soulless and heartless? I have as much soul as you and full as much heart. And if God had blessed me with beauty and wealth, I could make it as hard for you to leave me as it is for I to leave you. I'm not speaking to you through mortal flesh. It is my spirit that addresses your spirit, as if we'd passed through the grave and stood at God's feet equal, as we are. As we are. I am a free human being with an independent will which I now exert to leave you. Then let your will decide your destiny. I offer you my hand, my heart. Jane, I ask you to pass through life at my side. You are my equal and my likeness. Will you marry me? Are you mocking me? Do you doubt me? So I think there's a direct parallel between Jane and Bertha and how they kind of combat this idea that women need to have complete self-control in regards to their uh, romantic feelings. Um, Jane sort of knows what she wants and is not willing to give herself up. The fact that she um, turned down marriage from Sinjin because she knew that she would not be happy romantically. Um, portrays that sort of drive. In chapter 34, Jane states, Can I receive from him the bridal ring, endure all forms of love, which I doubt not he would scrupulously observe, and know that the spirit was quite absent? Can I bear the consciousness that every endearment he bestows is a sacrifice made on principle? No, such a martyrdom would be monstrous. I will never undergo it. As his sister, I might accompany him, not as his wife. I will tell him so. Repression in Charlotte Bronte's own life, such as the fact that she wasn't able to publish her novels under her own name, are clearly reflected in the characters she created in Jane Eyre. I think using um, literary works to gain insight on a certain period of time in history is very helpful because you can kind of get the point of view from a more personal level um, and authors who write during a certain period of time um, most likely reflect their own feelings in the characters that they create which is very evident throughout Jane Eyre. So that is the end of this documentary. Um, I just want to say that I really enjoyed learning about this topic and I hope I was able to um, demonstrate it in a way that was easy to understand for you guys. And I hope you can walk away with this with a little more um, information about what life was truly like for women during the Victorian age and how their actions shaped the modernist period today. Thank you for watching.